to the program, our talk will be in English, but result, uh, since approximately everyone here talks German, is anyone here who does not uh, understand German? Yeah. We would prefer English. If it's not you would prefer English? Yeah. Okay. No so we are, we are not native English, so I hope you can live with our English. But I think we will survive, is that okay? Yeah, um, before we talk, um, our talk is about CTF Hackers Toolbox. We will talk about what CTF actually means, uh, what hacking in this context means, and about the toolbox involved in that. But before that, we uh, want to do a short uh, audience survey. Um, who of you considers uh, themselves an uh, administrator? Like who is doing system administrating? Okay, who considers themselves like more like developer? Okay, that's why we're in the developer talk, right? <laughs> uh, then the, the fancy new term is up, so like who is doing both? None, okay. And who is doing none of the three? Okay. It's, it seems you're on the right topic. Um, before we start, my name is Stefan, I'm uh, a computer science student at the Graz and also a CTF player since a few years and Michael here is uh, also a computer science student in Graz, also a CTF player for a bit longer time. Um, okay. <laughs> Uh, I think so. We have a fancy device here that is capturing our talk and it like that 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 makes a bit of a problem. Blinken. Das tut er nämlich nicht. I don't know. Ah, oh, it's okay. Okay. We hope it's working. <coughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, so before we stop and talk about uh, tools, <laughs> does anybody know how to fix this uh, from the organizers? Anyone? No? Okay. Um, I guess we can survive with a bit of flickering of the beamer. Um, so CTF stands doesn't stand for Cyber Task Force, but for Capture the Flag. And um, in this context, Capture the Flag doesn't mean the, the fancy sports where you run around. Um, in the woods, it doesn't mean the quake mode capture the flag, of course, but uh, it means uh, capture the flag. But in the it's a competitive hacking competition. So uh, I will talk about later what it means in detail. But in the end, you uh, work as a team against other teams, solving competitions related to crypto uh, hacking, pioneering uh, web all kinds of categories, but the important part is, um, in contrast to many other competitions in that field, you work as a team and you work against other teams. Um, and the goal, as the name said, is capture the flag, but what the heck is a flag? So in our context, this is a flag, just a quick text that's somewhere hidden on <laughs> behind the broken beam. Uh, that's hidden somewhere in a binary, like you get a random binary where you don't know what it actually does, and somewhere in there is this flag hidden, and your task is to, to, to reverse engineer that, to figure out uh, where in the binary that is, what it is. Of course, there are also crypto challenges where you need to solve uh, some kind of crypto cyber, and if you solve it, you get that flag out, and you get a point, and that's basically the point of the whole uh, capture the flag thing, so solve challenges, X things, get flags, get points. Um, Who is playing CTF? So uh, we are like playing CTF, but there are a lot of other teams in the world. There are capture the flag competitions almost uh, every weekend. So right now is one running organized by Google. That's really fancy. That's the first one this year. But there are also a lot of other competitions organized in the context of uh, most of the time security uh, conferences or yeah, other things. Um, so basically there are two capture the flag modes. One is called Jeopardy. So who knows the quiz show Jeopardy in the US? Many people do. Uh, there you have this uh, board where you can pick a question from a certain category and then a level um, how much points you get when you solve that. And that's basically also what we have here. So we... Uh, okay. <coughs> 
you have different categories, like for example, here you see crypto, and then you can say, I want to solve this, or that, or that, or that, or that, and you get like 24 points, or 50 points, or whatever points when you solve that. And uh, the, the thing here is you get from the organizers the challenges, like they provide you binaries, they provide you with a website where you need to find a bug, where you, they provide you with a crypto challenge, but you, you don't really attack other teams, you only uh, solve challenges like small parcels. But in the other mode, that's called offense defense, you, you get your own virtual infrastructure, like for example, when we, we are this team, we get the virtual machine that's hosted somewhere at the computer in our lab. That's the other team that's somewhere else in the world. They have the same virtual machine with the same services. You're connected via a virtual network, so you don't need to understand the details. But in the end, uh, you have a lot of services. Uh, here you see different services from different teams. And uh, everyone has the same services. The services have bugs. And you need to, one, find the bugs in your own services, uh, fix them, of course and to exploit the services for the other teams. So that's really what, uh, it feels like security in real life, it's very competitive, it's very fast. We play eight hours <coughs> straight focused. Uh, and why we're doing that? Yeah, of course. <coughs> because it's fun in the end. It's, uh, it's, it's great when, when people uh, learn things about security, often you, you know, okay, when I program something in theory, someone could exploit that, so when I program it, I should think about make, making it really secure, but you never have the opportunity to apply the things you learn at university or in courses or somewhere else to, to really get um, experience, and that's what, what CTFs are really great, so we can learn what we, and we can apply what we learn. And we can also learn from each other, so different people bring different knowledge. Also, other teams have other knowledge, and it's very common to, after the CTF, exchange uh, solutions, and so you learn a lot. And also, it's, it really it can really apply to real uh, security problems in real world. So often, many CTF challenges are modeled after bugs in, that already occurred somewhere in the, the real life, and most of uh, sometimes it's the, the other way around, where something that was a CTF challenge later is a real life bug. <laughs> because people start to take a closer look. And we are um, a CTF team in Graz, we are called Los Fasis. We are uh, basically at these security students from uh, Theo Graz, but also people who don't study at Theo Graz. So when you're interested in that, just as a hint, you don't need to be a student, just interested in IT security and we are people who, who want to apply the things we learn at university um, but don't have the opportunity to do that in at like a company so we participate in capture the flag challenges since about two years with more or less good success and we also have irregular meetups so if you look at our homepage that's uh, up here um, you can check out our meetups and you can just visit us if there is one. Um, they are mostly at Infeld ca campus of Theokrat. And we talk about what we do during CTFs, but we also do lectures about related topics. And they are open and free and just come. Also, you can follow us on Twitter and somewhere else. And that's what I mentioned earlier, when, when a CTF is over, most people uh, who solve the challenge sit down and write down how they solved it and they, they publish it either at their own homepage, so here are our so-called write-ups, or at the big repository that's full of all kinds of solutions. So when there is no CTF running, it's really about sharing the experience and the information so everyone can learn from everyone and um, really when you're frustrated and don't solve one comp uh, challenge, it's often great to sit down afterwards, need, read, okay, what, what was I missing? And then, ah, I almost had it, but I was close. But the next time, maybe. Uh, playing CTFs is a lot about experience that can you gain during playing CTFs. It's a lot about knowledge that can you gain when you're either curious or when you also study like computer science. But uh, again, it's not necessary to be a computer science student. Just when you're curious, you, you learn that on yourself or somewhere else. Uh, but um, what's also very useful is uh, a good toolbox, so good tools that support you when you automate stuff. 
because we have, we have a lot of different challenges, <coughs> we have a lot of different technologies, so we, we really, really need to, to be very fast in understanding new technologies. Uh, <coughs> experience helps a lot again, and um, yeah, I think I already said that. Um, so for a start, uh, automation is always your best friend. Um, be comfortable doing things. So if you're working with like Linux or uh, whatever operating systems, you probably know the, the, the tools that that are there. You automate a lot already. That's also true for capture the flag. So when it comes to passing, automating all that stuff, <coughs> um, really the tools that are already there are useful. For example, you don't need to read that in detail, but that's a, a quick uh, password brute forcing tool just with a short tail script. That's in, in Python. There is, for example, the, the Python requests module that really helps you when you, when you do things with web. Uh, here we, we have a, um, <coughs> a SQL injection that's sent to the server without needing to do to draft all the, the, the requests in the browser. So when we, we do challenges that do other work too. So, for example, when we request something, then apply some crypto and then send it back to the server. That's really helpful when you can do it in a script and when you don't need to copy paste around in the browser or somewhere. Of course, there are other tools, but Python requests is one of the tools of our choice. So that's a really, really cool library with a really uh, simple API. And if it's need to be, if it needs to be a bit more fancy, there are the phone tools. That's a, a library from from another. CTF team, um, so they, they, they also share what they, they develop during CTFs, and they, they have a lot of tools to work with binaries, but also again with the, the network, so just uh, as a hint if you want to automate more network communication. Now to the, the main part of our talk, so we again want to talk about tools. Uh, about tools you can use to, to, to exploit uh, bugs and vulnerabilities, to, to harden your things, but also to, to analyze things. So before you, when you get a, a program that's not written by you, before you can exploit it, you want to analyze it. So we, we first want to we focus about the analyzing <coughs> part. And um, as a quick start, the most easiest things when you get a binary, that's what we cover later, but these days you get a lot of uh, apps on mobile, they are written in .NET or uh, Objective-C or um, Android, uh, the Java, and these are the more easy challenges because of course they are not compiled to binary but to a uh, bytecode, and bytecode is really, really great to decompile. So even when the things are obfuscated, we just throw it in one of those tools, we get off the get out the, the, the Java code or the .NET code, we can look at it, find code. It's easier than to, to look at the binary directly. Uh, here we, we just listed some um, binaries we use. This Java decompilers.com is like decompiler as a service that's useful when you don't want to install all the things on your machine. But uh, Smiley tool and uh, just chat print things for .NET, it's what we use and it works great. Uh, sadly, not everything here is um, open source, so JetBrains, of course, is proprietary software. And now Michael is going to talk about uh, a bit harder part of the analyzing. Oh. Okay, so <coughs> let's suppose a white binary appears. Uh, so this is something that's very common during CTFs. You get just thrown a binary, no source code, no debugging symbols. If you're lucky, you get, you have, you know where the functions are, you know what they're called. Um, but that's sometimes or rarely the case. Um, if you've ever developed uh, C or C++, you've probably seen something like this. Uh, so object dump, uh, part of the bin utils, you can disassemble stuff with that. It looks like this. No, this is just horrible, like, <coughs> nobody can see anything here, so that's, uh, you can't debug a, a 10 megabyte build binary with that, or disassemble, that's, that's just crazy, um, but fortunately, there is a tool for that, so I'd say keep, keep calm and use Radara 2 from Git, um, what is Radara 2, it's 
first of all, nobody knows how to pronounce it correctly. Uh, <laughs> But it's a reverse engineering toolkit, I'd say. It has a lot of features. Um, so it's a hex edit editor, disassembler. Um, I don't know, it can emulate code. You can script it. Um, it has so many features, I don't know everything. But the thing we use the most is probably this. So this has really bad con <laughs> contrast. Um, well, but you can see it's basically the same as object number, just with colors, so that's nice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so of course, it does a little bit more. Um, so for example, it resolves strings, so it just tells us, okay, this is a string, it's in, and uh, we can directly see the contents of the string here. Um, it, it's hard to see here, but there are, uh, the targets of jumps are marked uh, using, um, <coughs> using arrows, um, but, can also show us the same function like this. So this is basically a summary gra graph of the basic blocks. And I'm sure everyone, everyone agrees, if you even if you don't know anything about assembler at all, you can probably guess what this function is doing. So we have something that's called check size, okay. Uh, one branch just does puts, and the other one does save and buff buffer and puts. Yeah. Probably this is the error message and this is the success message. Okay, we know what this is doing. Um, we can skip this function and just look at check size and save in buffer. So this is really easy to spot here. If you're using object dump, no way. Uh, um, of course, we can also look at it in a more detailed way if, you, um, if you're not completely sure. Um, then we see the, the, the assembly instructions here. And uh, that's really, um, really small, but here we can see the, the error message, no, no, the file is too big, and on the other hand, the, the file has been saved successfully. Um, yeah. So that's really helpful, and makes it easier to analyze uh, binaries. So just some, some examples what Radare can do. Um, it has a really cryptic command line. <laughs> So it's not really easy to, to use, but uh, if you're used to it, you're, you're getting pretty fast. Uh, and some stuff you, you always use, it's, it's just, it works well. So for example, we can use uh, this AFL command to, with a, the tilde, it's a built-in grab, so we can um, grab for functions, for example, that contain exec, might be interesting. Um, or search for strings in a binary. Of course, there's also the strings tool, but um, Radar does it more fancy. Um, uh, also other things like computing CRCs over, over, let's say, the next 32 bytes. So, I don't know, one time I, I fixed a, a PNG file which, has, which had uh, broken CRC sums, so I just popped into Radar and fixed all the CRC sums manually. Uh, no problem. Uh, <laughs> a word about binary decompilers. Yeah, we heard uh, Java really easy to decompile, or .NET. Unfortunately, with binaries, um, not so much. Uh, especially there are no open source decompilers. So if you're reading CTF write-ups, you probably will see some <coughs> snippets of decompiled code. Um, because many, many teams, um, they're like, they cheat a little, they invest a lot of money or, well, use Russian copies of, um, of yeah, they are all full of malware, so don't do that. Um, so there's X-Rays or either Pro, the decompiler, which is very, very good. So that's like, uh, the state of the art decompiler works very well, especially on um, non, not of obfuscated, Com binaries, um, but yeah, it's like crazy expensive. So, and it, yeah, that's why we don't use it. <laughs> uh, there's also Hopper, which is pretty cool. Uh, it's like one one French guy, I think, who develops this, and it's uh, rather cheap. Um, but unfortunately, again, closed doors. Um, so we don't like to use it. Um, there is also Red Stack, which works reasonably reasonably well, but it's uh, just a web service. 
Uh, so you can, if you're like it, in the CTF setting, it's no problem. Um, you can just upload the binary because you don't care. care. But if you're like analyzing or looking <coughs> at uh, some some binary you don't want to share with with whoever operates that service, um, yeah, you're all out of luck. Also, no no 64-bit uh, Intel, so that's well, like sucks because that's uh, 80 percent of all the binaries. But okay. Um, so assuming we, we now know what the binary is doing, we, we have analyzed it statically, uh, now let's look at debugging. So debugging, everybody I think has done it. Um, if you have ever de developed C or something, you know this one. Good old GDB. <laughs> like, again, we, same as object down, this just sucks. Um, if you have uh, source code, it's not that bad because you can step through the lines and so. But really, GDB is horrible for debugging without uh, source code. Uh, maybe even with source code. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, again, we have a great tool for that. Um, this is PETA. This is a GDB plugin. So it's not a standalone tool, but a plugin, which makes um, using GDB on well binaries a little more comfortable. So it has some fancy things like automatically. So this just, if you hit the break, break point, it just dumps you all this info, which is kind of interesting, like the registers. Here we have the context of in where in the code we are. It um, tells us whether a jump is taken or not, and stuff like that. <coughs> um, yeah, it also has nice, here we have the stack. Uh, I think it's really hard to see, right? But um, it does some nice things like um, if it finds an address on the stack, it resolves it and tries to tell you if this is an um, address that is in the code segment or if it's an address on the stack. And if it's a string, then it tries to display the string. Um, so you know what, what you're dealing with um, with one glance. Um, yeah. Uh, other, all the other things, it has some, some nice shortcuts for the more um, horrible GDB parts, but more or less it's G still GDB, but it works pretty well. Um, so this is not the only one. Uh, PETA, this is the one I use most of the time, um, but there are also other ones which are um, equally useful. Uh, GEF for if you are debugging non-x86 binaries or Pondbag if you are uh, used to running broken software from Git, uh, <laughs> um, but there's also Voltron and GDB dashboard which do like Tmux things, so it just looks nicer. Or if you don't like uh, GDB, you can also use LLDB, which is um, well equally horrible, but syntax, same syntax, uh, different syntax. And also that other, of course, it's a reverse engineering tool toolkit. It can, it can do everything, so it also can debug stuff. Uh, feels a little bit bit like uh, windy bugs <coughs> with the shortcuts and stuff. Um, yeah. Um, there are also some interesting newer approaches. For example, Kira, just that's like a timeless debugger, so you can basically step back, not, not only step forward, but step back. Uh, it basically makes snapshot at every point in time. And um, there's also RR for record and replay, I think. Um, so that's by Mozilla. and. This is just uh, tries to make debugging deterministically. So it's still using GDB, but you don't have to deal with, uh, if you do, you record a run of your, of your test or whatever, and then you replay it and it will be always be exactly the same. So all the addresses are the same, all the, um, so if you have some kind of randomization or depend on timing or whatever, will all, everything will be the same each at each debugging run. Uh, so um, you, make stuff uh, uh, easier sometimes. Okay, so now we have the analysis tools. I'm going to talk about pawning. So now we have a vulnerability and then we want to break it, uh, exploit it. Um, and again, as we, uh, let's assume it's for example a stack-based buffer overflow uh, and again pawn tools. So it's not just only a great way to do or a simple way to do TCP networking. Um, it's also great for exploitation or the main use case actually. 
So it has stuff like an ELF parser, so the binary format. Um, it also helps you do return-oriented programming, so that's an exploitation technique. And um, it really abstracts all the, the gory details, so you don't have to mess around with addresses so much. Um, and it's just nicer, and it also works if you like um, have slightly different versions of, of binaries. So it looks up symbols and stuff, if, it, if they are there. <coughs> it then can also launch um, the process you want to exploit. For example, here we have the pawn process. And it can also launch GDB from with inside uh, your script, so that if your exploit isn't working, you can debug it and see what's going on. Um, pretty nice. And it also has this interactive mode. Uh, by default, all the input and output is uh, you have to read it. But if you want to interact directly with the, um, with the process you're attacking, you can just switch to this interactive mode and, um, well, type stuff into it. And it forwards all the things to the process and from the process. It's also very useful if you, for example, launch the shell if your exploit is successful and uh, want to just type commands in it. OK, so this is an example run. Uh, we can see here some info about the, the binary we are attacking. This is like the, the RobChamp builder. So we can see an address here. But uh, of course, this is resolved. And just tells us this is the address of exit. And um, yeah, some can build so easily build some nice text. And you see this uh, fancy logging infrastructure. <laughs> Yeah, and here we see uh, the program then stop with exit code 32, which is exactly what we <coughs> specified here in the ROP chain. But um, yeah, other nice features of Pawn Tools, so it, it has a pretty huge or pretty good collection of shell code. So that's our small snippets of, of assembly that just do one thing. Uh, for example, here, this is, I think, in 20. 1 bytes or 22 bytes um, uh, spawning a shell. So that's pretty small. I think, um, I don't think it, can, it gets much smaller. And um, there are a lot of different like, types of uh, such shell codes, like, I don't know, um, calling top 2 on, on a socket or something like that. Uh, you can also chain those together, <coughs> basically scripting as an assembler. Of course, yeah, here we see um, the hex dump of the, then the assembled um, code. OK. So we've seen a little bit about Pawn Tools, or Finitsu, the fork, uh, has some more advanced features. So basically, you also have an I.O. abstraction. So it's easy to test the exploit locally. You just create a local um, process and just switch it um, with a remote process, which uh, talks to the um, the process you are attacking via TCP on the um, on the server of, for example, of the organizers or something. So you can easily test locally and with exactly the same code, just um, switch out one line and you're talking to the remote part. Um, as I said, you have um, support for shell code and other pawning and yeah, other useful stuff. <coughs> So last but not least, a, a, little, a little bit of about cryptography. Um, we won't talk much about this because uh, probably not the most relevant for, um, the, yeah, for the daily developer life. Let's say it that way. Uh, but often there are challenges where you have to implement a certain uh, attack or um, there's a flawed crypto scheme and you have to break it. Um, here, the, the most important tool is probably your pen and a, a piece of paper. It just makes it easier to just draw diagrams and try to analyze what is going on. Um, for the actual attacks, we really like to use Sage. Um, I don't know if, if many of you know Sage, but it's a computer algebra system. And uh, well, the programming language is Python, and it has Python interoperability, which, which makes it great for, for doing, um, yeah, implementing attacks. Um, 
So for example, you can just import the pawn tools into Sage and then do use the network communication from that. And also Python is also in general pretty pretty good because there are a lot of um, packages that implement uh, existing existing attacks like I don't know padding oracle attacks or hash length extension attacks. Just um, you don't need to know much about these act attacks actually. You just need to identify the vulnerability and use those tools. Um, yeah. But now pretty much at the end. Um, the most important thing here um, for playing CTFs, you need to learn to improv improvise. Um, like premature optimization is the root of all evil in CTFs. That's like most important thing you need to keep in your head because you're very time constrained. Um, also comment in code, clean code, whatever. It doesn't matter during CTFs. You just, if it works, um, if, you're, if a bash one liner works, no time to clean it up. Just fire and forget. Of course, this is only true uh, during CTFs or if you're uh, actually um, not working or need to fix something really quick or do something very quick. Um, it would be nice if you're like after the CTF or after whatever if you've done, you've done, um, just clean up the stuff so that we can or that you can reuse it between different CTFs or different settings. Um, of course, that would be nice. Um, <laughs> rarely happens, but okay. Um, yeah, and a fool with a tool is still a fool. So. <laughs> So those, of course, all those uh, tools are nice. They they help you a lot, but uh, but they don't exploit stuff for you. They don't fix stuff for you. They don't find vulnerabilities automatically most of the time. But you still need to know what's going on. And if it, if your if a tool is failing, then you need to find out why it is failing. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. That's it. If you're interested. Go to our most awesome domain, and we thank a bunch of people. Uh, yeah, thank you.